Welcome again to our program, Revelation of the Coming King. I would like once again to introduce myself, especially for you who are for the first time watching this program. I am Ranko Stefanovic, professor in the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary, Andrews University. The courses that I teach are subjects from the New Testament. And most of those courses that I teach is actually the book of Revelation at the time and events. So I'm so happy to be with you here again. And we are going to study the Word of God, the last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. And I just want to remind you once again that this series um, is about study of the book of Revelation. We started with chapter 1, and we will conclude with chapter 22. But as you know that with such short time like, like this program, it's impossible to cover everything that is in one chapter. We would need much more time. And I would like to encourage you that once this program is over, that you go into continue further and much deeper way, okay, the text is just covered during this presentation. But maybe you will ask question and say, well, we have got now some guidance, but what after? Praise God, I would like to suggest to you, you need some tools, there are many good tools made, made by Christians, but one of the good tool that I would like to suggest to you uh, um, and, and uh, all presentations that we made here are based on the content of this book titled Revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a product of scholarly research. And every time I will always tell you about pages that you can go after this presentation and open this book, get many good material and with a lot of prayer, study the word of God for yourself, whether by yourself or maybe in company with your fellow Christians from, from your church there. So today's presentation is based on the pages starting with 217. So the page 217, and you have next 40, 50 pages there. You see, it's a lot, a lot of material. It's my strong desire that the Holy Spirit, who promised to teach us into all the truth, that really he guide us in understanding of the truth of the Bible. And that's what we will do exactly at this time. We would like to ask God for his presence and his guidance as we study this very interesting section of the book of Revelation. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity that we can open your word, the last book of the Bible, and to see how great valuable lessons we can find on the pages of this book. And Father, so many times we wonder, why did you write this book in a much easier way for us to understand? But we know that you do everything what is best for us humans and according to your wisdom. And thank you, thank you for helping us with the different tools that we can dig much deeper in your word. So please be with us and teach us because we would like to see Jesus Christ in our midst so that all human beings be hidden in him. Father, thank you for the presence in our midst and we pray all of this in the precious name of the one who died on the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. In order to go further into the book of Revelation, I just need to take a few moments to remind us of what we covered last time. Because what we studied last time, it's crucial, let me repeat one more time, it's crucial for the understanding of the next few chapters of the book of Revelation. Let me put it in different way. The way how we interpret Revelation 5 will define our interpretation of Revelation 6 the chapter that we will be studying together. The time in which you 
foot and apply the scene of Revelation 5 is the starting point for the interpretation of the seven seals of Revelation 6. So I would like to keep you in mind. That's why chapter 5 is so crucial and so important for those chapters that follow. Okay. So last time we could see that Revelation 5 portrays one of the crucial moments in the history of the plan of salvation, namely that when Jesus, after his death on the cross, his resurrection, and finally his ascension there to the heavenly places there, went there into the heavenly throne room. And according to Revelation chapter 4, all the heavenly assembly was there waiting for him to celebrate his triumph. But there is something more. You saw last time, even though we just mentioned few passages, how much New Testament talks about that occasion, specifically, specifically stating that, that uh, um, those heavenly beings, in addition to celebrate Jesus' triumph, they were there to celebrate his enthronement. Because there in the heavenly places, Jesus was enthroned in the, on the heavenly throne. Let me explain one more time something. You know, when God created the first human couple, it was God's plan for Adam to be a kind of a ruler. He was supposed to be the father of the human race. If you open the book of Genesis chapter 1 there, from verses 24 and so on, when God created man in his image, then God said to Adam, I'm giving you dominion over the entire creation on the earth. But then we go to chapter 3, unfortunately, a tragic event in human history that Satan deceived the first human couple. And he took for himself, he simply stole that dominion over the planet earth. Actually, Jesus, we will see that later when we go to Revelation chapter 12, Jesus called Satan the ruler of this world. But everything changed with the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid that price for human beings to redeem them from the kingdom of darkness and from Satan. And then when Jesus ascended there to the heavenly places, okay, in the presence of all those heavenly beings there waiting for him, representatives of all those different worlds, there was a transference of the dominion from Satan to Jesus. It is at that moment that Jesus was enthroned at the right hand of the Father, and he became the ruler of this world. Please keep in mind, keep in mind that Satan is still messing up <laughs> in, this, in, this, in this world. We will see that the book of Revelation presents him as an angry enemy. However, Jesus Christ is still in control, in control. We are waiting still for that time when finally he will become the king. Okay. This is very, very important. It's very important for the understanding. The next section of the book of Revelation, we saw that the enthronement of Christ took place on the day of Pentecost. So if it was on the day of Pentecost, we have even the year. It's the year 31 AD. Please, this date is very important one more time. And this is the starting point for Revelation chapter, chapter 6. By the way, why we are talking so much about that? Because many Christians are struggling because they see the importance of the seven seals of Revelation 6. But they have a hard time to put those seals in the historical context. They don't know in which time period to put it. But we have already heard the answer. If they are in the heavenly places in the year 31, around the day of Pentecost, Jesus was enthroned and he took that seal scroll, the scroll that was sealed with the seven seals. 
And if Revelation 6, number one, after taking that book, now Jesus is breaking the seals one after, no. at what time period or what point in history we should put the beginning of the seals? Naturally, it's with the day of Pentecost. And by the way, you will see very soon, just in a few moments, how this is a crucial element for the understanding of the seven seals. So the day of Pentecost, that very important point in, in the history of the plan of, of, of salvation, it's very important and that's why this event could not pass without being mentioned to John the Revelator there, there in the vision. We see that when Jesus took that scroll and when he started opening the seals with breaking each one of the seals keep in mind the seals the, the 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 seals are broken where in heaven okay but every time when jesus breaks one seal there is an event taking place on earth actually telling us that so many times we see that history is very messy actually telling us that the heaven and the earth or the earth and heaven are closely connected so now I would like to invite you that you turn with me to Revelation chapter 6 we're going now now to this chapter and you will see that the seven, the breaking or the opening of the seven seals, they have a certain pattern. The first four seals are quite different than the rest. How are they different? Because the first four seals, every time, every time when Jesus opens one of those seals, a colorful horse with the rider appears on the scene. So let us now go to the text and to see what we can read about these seals. I'd like you to go to chapter 6 and we will read verses 1 and 2 that actually describe the first seal. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying as with the voice of thunder, come, and I looked and behold a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. You will notice this is a very interesting scene. And what is this all about? Christians and many students of the book of Revelation are divided on this. Let me, let me just summarize one more time in details these, these two verses. And then you will see how already we have a significant hint here in the text what the scene is about. So as Christ opens the first seal, a white horse, white horse, okay, steps onto the scene. The rider on the horse holds a bow and is given a crown. The word that is used here for the crown is the Stephanos crown. It's the crown of victory. This is very, very important. We had white color and we have the Stephanos crown. It's a garland, okay? This rider is a conqueror. The text says that he goes forward conquering in order to completely conquer. Uh, it's very interesting in John's day that the Roman emperor when he celebrated the triumph after the war, he would ride on a white horse. Okay, the conquering celebra celebration. Actually, there are many Christians, they believe that this seal portrays Antichrist. I believe that this view, interpretation does not match with what we have here in the book of Revelation. Let us, let us try to see it objectively. The scene is evidently symbolic, as normally Christians, they, they understand it. When you go to the Old Testament, 
God is sometimes pictured as riding a horse with a bow in his hand, conquering the enemies of his people. And please allow me just to take one of those texts and read, which is found in the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3, 8 to 13. There are many more texts. But you will see something very interesting in this text that really serves as a background to what we have here in the book of Revelation. Habakkuk 3, 8 to 13. Did the Lord rage against the rivers? Or was your anger against the rivers? Or was your wrath against the sea? Now, now, please pay attention. That you rode on your horse, on your chariots of salvation. Your bow was made bare. The roads of chastment were sown. You cleaved the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and quaked. The downpour of water swept by. The deep uttered forth its voice. It lifted high its hands. Sun and moon stood in their places. They went away at the light of your arrows, your arrows, and the radiance of your gleaming spear. In indignation you marched through the earth. In anger you trampled the nations. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. What do we have here? Did you notice that the image of horses is used with reference to God? He's riding the horses. And he has the weapons. He's going to conquer and to win the salvation on behalf of his people. I'd like to invite also the viewers if you want to go to Psalm um, chapter 45, verses 4 and 5, and you will see there very similar picture, picture there of God, of, of God. If we go to Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 16, we have Jesus Christ as riding on the white horse, Revelation 19, leading the heavenly armies in the final battle of the earth history. And friends, this rider in the first seal is not Antichrist. This is the symbolic portrayal of God in the Bible, but there is, there is much more. You see, the rider, okay, rides on the white horse. White is a symbol of purity, not evil or Antichrist. And it's regularly associated with Christ and his followers in the Bible. Did you notice something else that we, that we mentioned? The rider has the Stephanos crown. In the Bible, you remember, especially in the book of Revelation, the Stephanos crown is not a crown promised to the Antichrist. <laughs> it's something that is promised only to God's victorious people. And then finally, the two, time, two times the word to conquer and conquering is mentioned. This brings to mind Revelation 3.21. As I conquer or overcome and sit with my father on his throne, then you go to Revelation 5. You remember why Jesus was worthy of taking the seal scroll, because he conquered. So actually all the descriptions of the horse and the rider on the, on the horse is actually associated with Christ and the gospel and, 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 his, and his people. So, what do we have here in the first seal? What is this horse and the rider all about? Let's go back to Revelation 5. Okay, when in Re Revelation 5, Jesus took that scroll. Please, you have now to help me. What was that that started on the day of Pentecost? The proclamation, the preaching of the gospel, you see, when Jesus took that scroll, he was proclaimed by the whole heavenly assembly to be really the real ruler of the planet Earth. But then what happens? Jesus knew that there are some territories on the Earth that are rebellious against him. They don't want to accept his, his authority. So that's why on the day of Pentecost, by using the picture of the victorious rider riding on a horse. He goes conquering and starting to conquer is the best illustration of what started on the day of Pentecost, preaching of the gospel, trying to conquer the hearts of people 
for Christ that many, many territories still to be, to be conquered. And you know, I just want to remind you when you go to the book of Acts, you remember that what happened with that first, first day of the preaching of the gospel, 3,000 people were won for Christ. Then the book of Acts says that daily people were being won for Christ. Then 5,000 people. Then Apostle Paul mentioned, he said, by his own time, he said, the gospel has been preached to every creature on, on, the, on this earth. So going with the first century there, we see the conquest of the gospel. So the best interpretation that fits, fits here is actually that the first horse, that white horse, and the rider with the Stephanos crown stands as a symbol for the gospel that started being preached on the day of Pentecost. Can I ask you a question? When you do it in the right way, when you let the Bible interpret itself, is the book of Revelation really so difficult as people think? It's only it's so difficult. It gives such a great joy. Your heart is full of the love of God. But let's now go to the second seal. I'd like to invite you with me to read verses three and four. When he, the lamb, broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come, and another, please pay attention, a red horse went out, and to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that man would slay one another and a great sword was given to him. So now, as Christ opens the second seal, a fiery red, this is the meaning in Greek, fiery red, horse appears onto the scene. If you go to the Bible, a red is regularly the color of a bloodshed. Okay, and really corresponds to the mission of this, this horse. Did you notice what we read here in the text? That the rider has a large sword. What do you do with the sword? We know what we do with knife. But what do you do with the sword? Sword is not to be used in the kitchen. It's used for the purpose of war. And this rider, according to the text, is allowed to take the peace from the earth so that people can slay each, rather, each, each uh, uh, another. Pay attention to something. Usually people miss it when they read the text. That's why we have different interpretations. It's not the rider who kills. He only carries the sword as a symbol of what is going on. Actually, he only takes the peace from the earth and let people kill each other. Did you notice it? Please read the careful text. Okay. So let's see what this second seal is about. Number one, we have to understand something. This fiery red horse follows the white one. Okay? He right, follows the first one, the white one. And we saw that the first horse and the first horseman show that through the preaching of the gospel, Christ is waging spiritual warfare against the forces of evil. He tried to win people for himself, to save them from the dominion of Satan, from those rebellious territories, to bring them close to Christ. However, what happens, please, you have now to help me. What happens when the gospel is being preached? And when Christ goes on through the gospel, conquering and to conquer, what actually happens? The forces of evil regularly resist to that, okay? They give a strong resistance to the spreading of the gospel. There are rarely those who reject the gospel against those who accept it. What is the result? Persecution, okay? So the gospel always divides people. If you open the New Testament, many passages, we will read about that. So while some people accept the gospel, some people reject it, and they turn against those who accept the gospel. Are you still with me? Read the text. This is the concept that we have here. 
By the way, I would like you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 and 36. This text is very important. Jesus said, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but the sword. What? Sword. The main concept in the sixth seal is the sword and to take the peace from the earth. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And now the last sentence. And man's enemies will be the members of his household. Did you notice here what Jesus said? By the way, you can see that actually the second seal reflects the sayings of Jesus. I'd like to suggest to you, when you have a time, once this presentation is over, try to underline the key words from here, from Matthew chapter 10, 34 to 36, and go underline the key words in the, in the, in the second seal, and you will be surprised what you will get, that actually the second seal is there a writing of these words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 10? So what do we have? So what is that that we, that we have here? Is it's when the gospel is being preached, persecution is something that takes regularly. But we have another. I just want to remind you that we said that the Bible is the best interpreter. If you want to understand the book of Revelation, you always have to go to the Old Testament. There are many passages from the New Testament that are also ref reflected, and you could see al already that. By the way, when you go to the, to, the, to the Old Testament, I'm just giving you a few references. We will not show them there on the screen. Judges 7.22, Isaiah 19.2, and Zechariah 14.13. In all these passage passages, you will see how very often the enemies of God's people, when they turn against God's people, they turn against each other. So there is a strong Old Testament background here to the, to the second seal. So here in the second seal, those who resist and reject the gospel, they turn each other in persecution. Let's go now to the third seal, our verses 5 and 6. When he, the Lamb, broke the third seal. I heard that the third living creature says, come. And I looked and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. I know what you think. How we understand the first and the second seal? It's logical. But what is the third seal all about? Now once again, we will see how it's important to let the Bible interpret itself. So let's summarize one more time. As Christ the Lamb, Lamb, opens the third seal. Now you have the third horse. What color? A black horse with a rider appears on, the, on, 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 the, on that horse, okay? However, this rider does not have any weapon. <laughs> it's quite different. Actually, he holds a scale for weighting food in his hand. And John, at, at the moment, he also hears an announcement by the one of the four living beings. You remember that? A quart of wheat for denarius and three quarts of barley for denarius and do not harm the oil and the wine. Now I hope that I was able to, to, to emphasize the key terms here. Is. So what are the key elements here? Is? We have a wheat and we have a barley here. These are actually the central concept. And then you have oil, and you have wine. If you go to the Old Testament, friends, if you go 
um, to, the, to the Old Testament. Oil and wine, sorry, grain, oil, and wine were the three main crops in Palestine. They were actually a symbol of existence. They were in a nutshell the reference to the daily necessities for people to survive, to live, normal life. By the way, they are very often mentioned in the Old Testament as the basic necessities of life. I would like just um, to mention here a um, few references from, from the Old Testament just to see actually what we are talking, talking about. If you go to the book of Leviticus, chapter 26, 26, by the way, we will come to the book of Leviticus 26 one more time and we read this text, but just here in this context. Moses spoke to the people of Israel, telling them if they are faithful to God, how many blessings will come upon them. But if, if they are not faithful to God, then they will experience the curses. There will be the consequences of their departure. And then Moses said to them, Leviticus 26, 26, and please pay attention and you will see that all the key words that are actually found here also occur and they are used in the third seal. Moses said, in the name of God, when I break your staff of bread, ten women will bake your bread in one oven, oven, and they will bring back your bread in a rationed amount so that you will eat and not be satisfied. I apologize one more time, biblical scholar, and I have sometimes to refer to original languages. This text was written in Hebrew. So when you read the text in Hebrew, this is a little bit explanation. It says, they will bring back your bread weighted by measure. The same expression actually that is found here in the third seal. Okay, in the book of, of Ezekiel, when Ezekiel tried to make appeal to the people, okay, who departed from God and to bring them to repentance, Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 16, we have the following text. Please let us read it. Moreover, he, God, said to me, Son of man, behold, I am going to break the staff of bread in Jerusalem, and they will eat bread by weight. Do you see that? The same expression that we have in the third seal. And with anxiety and drink water by measure and in horror, because bread and water will be scarce, and they will be appalled with one another and waste away in their iniquity. You can see the strong Old Testament background that actually these three entity, grain, oil, and wine, were the three main crops. And if people are faithful to God, what will happen? God will give them these things in, abund in abundance. But according to Ezekiel, when they are unfaithful to God, what will happen to them? You saw it? Okay. In but we have another expression here, is denarius. Keep in mind, the Bible was not written in English in North America in the 21st century. Okay, so we don't have here dollars. We have a money from the first century in the Roman Empire. And in the first century in Palestine, a denarius was a daily wage. So it means when you work the whole day in normal circumstances, you would be paid a denarius. By the way, you, do you remember the parable of Jesus about those laborers waiting for somebody to hire them? And that gentleman went, hired the first group, says, I will give you one denarius. Then another group, then another group, and finally he gave to everybody denarius. That's why the first group rebelled. But he said, I'm sorry, I'm very just. You just got denarius, that's a daily wage, but I was merciful to people who did not work the whole day. So denarius was a daily wage. So in normal circumstances, people will work the whole day. How much are they paid? A denarius. And for that denarius, they were able to buy plenty of food 
for the entire family of about four or five. Are you still with me? But you know, when you work, you need something else besides the food. So do you want one denarius, you're able also to provide other necessities for your, for your family, okay? But what do you have here in the third seal? Let's read one more time. It's very important to keep in mind. It says, when he broke the third seal, verse 6, and I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures, a quart of wheat for a denarius. What does it mean? What does it mean? That when in normal circumstances for a daily wage, you are able to buy enough food and everything else for your family. Now, in the scene of the third seal, for one daily wage, you can buy just enough food to feed yourself and nobody else, not the members of the family. But something else. But it says that for the same amount of money, one denarius, you can buy three quarts of a barley. Barley was a secondary food, usually to feed your cattle there. And if people did not have something to eat, usually poor people had to depend on this kind of food. But it means if you eat barley, it means you are very, very poor. But keep in mind now that the person for one daily wage can buy three quarts of barley. So please, can you now help me? What is the scene that we have here? Give me just one word in English. It's a famine. It's a terrible, terrible uh, famine is there. Okay. Uh, so what are we talking here about? One more time, we are dealing with a symbolic language. So imager, the imagery of the third black horse and its rider points to what falls on the people, what happens to the people who reject the gospel and persecute those who, what is the next consequences of rejection of the gospel? It's a spiritual famine. The black color corresponds to the mission of the horse and its rider. Let's, let's explain it. How would you define the black? Dark. It's the opposite to white. If you go to the New Testament, the white color, you remember the first seal, the white horse, we saw it's the gospel. It's associated with the Christ and, and, and the gospel message. But when you have now the black color, it's opposite uh, to, the, to the gospel. So if the white color denotes the preaching of the gospel, the white horse, then the black horse signifies the absence of the gospel, the spiritual uh, famine. You see, when you go to the Bible, grain, it's a normal word for the word of God. Do you remember the parable of Jesus of the sower and the seed? Or actually in the Gospel of John chapter 6, 35 to 36, Jesus says, my words that I'm speaking to you is the bread that you are supposed to eat. So the rejection of the gospel usually results in the famine of the word of God. And if you go to the book of Amos chapter 8, verses 11 to 13, the prophet Amos foresaw that somewhere in the future on earth there will be a terrible famine of the word of God. But praise God. So one more time, the third seal, it's about the spiritual famine for the word of God. But we have here a very encouraging note. And what is that? The instruction was given, do not damage the oil and the wine. So this famine, the famine of the third seal is not fatal. The same was that commissioned to John, okay, to measure the food Okay, emphasizing 
the, 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 the extreme famine, the same voice, try to protect the wine and oil. And by the way, when we go to the Bible, we see that oil, symbolically, in spiritual way, symbolizes the Holy Spirit. And wine, regularly in the New Testament, stands for the salvation that we receive in Jesus Christ. So you see here the grace and the mercy of God. Amen. Even though the people rejected the gospel, and there are consequences, which is the famine, the shortage of the word of God, but God's grace and God's salvation is still available to the people, okay? For, for all those who want to accept it. And now finally, we are going to the fourth seal, the four, four horsemen, verse seven to eight. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come, and I looked and behold, an ancient horse, and he who sat on it had the name death, and Hades was following with him. And authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with the famine and with pestilence and by the wild beast of the earth. Now I know what you say. Evidently, the third seal makes sense. But what is the fourth seal now all about? Okay, with the opening of the fourth seal, a pale horse appears. Keep in mind that the fourth horse and the horsemen follow the third horse, the black horse and the rider. But in order to grasp the full meaning of this word, the word that we translate as a pale of Asian horse here is, is the Greek word chloros, which actually is the normal word for that Asian gray color of a dead body. You will find some commentators, some Bible translation, they use the word greenish, describing the horse, uh, the, the, the corpse that is, you know, in the, in the, in the state of decaying, okay? So the rider's name is death. Now you understand why, why the, the, the rider has the name death. And he's followed by Hades, which is actually the place of death. They are allowed, this death and Hades are allowed to destroy people by sword, by famine, by plague, and by the wild beast. And one fourth of the earth is given to them to harm it. It's very interesting is what appears here that the fourth horseman actually comprises the actions and unites the actions of the three previous horsemen. You see, the fourth seal describes the pestilence on the earth. And the graphic portrayal of the fourth horseman provides a further warning to the people who reject the gospel. One more time. The first horseman portrays the preaching of the gospel. The second one, the rejection of the gospel and the consequences of that. The third one, the further consequences of the, of the, of the gospel, which is a spiritual famine. What now comes next? It's actually the spiritual death. These are the extreme consequences for those who reject, who reject the gospel. However, we have here good news, praise God, is that the death and the Hades, their power and their activities are very limited. They're given the authority only over one fourth of the earth. The very beginning of the book provides the assurance that by his own death and resurrection. You remember the vision of Jesus Christ when he appeared to John there on Patmos. Je Jesus made very clear to John the virtue of his death. He won the victory over death and Hades. 
the two enemies of the human race. When the gospel is accepted, life is received as a gift, and the death does not have the authority over those who are saved in Jesus Christ any longer. Why? Because they belong to Jesus Christ, and he is the one who won the victory over these enemies of the human race. Okay, you can say this is very interesting news. But let me go one step further. Because the readers of the Bible, they ask questions, is that really only that what we have here with regard to these four horses? Just to tell us what happens when the gospel is preached. Yeah, that's one level of interpretation. You remember when we talk about the messages to seven churches, that there are three levels of interpretation. So also with regard to the seven seals, now we are focusing on the first four seals. It appears, and the Bible students also noticed, that there are somehow strong parallels between the historical application of the seven churches and the seven seals. So the Bible students, they notice that actually the first horseman historically can stand for the first century, which was really the time of the conquering gospel and what gospel did throughout the world in the first century. But then, and of course, in parallels, to the church in Ephesus, you remember, we, we talk about that. But then the Bible students also noticed that following the first century, that great success of the preaching of the gospel, during the second and the third century, it was a time of severe persecution. Do you remember we talked about the church in Smyrna? Persecuted the church. So what a better parallel to exist than what we have here, the correspondence between the second seal and the church in Smyrna, the second and third centuries, okay. Then what do we have the next one? Is the biblical students noticed that something happened following the second and the third centuries. What, what happened when Constantine finally made Christianity to be a legal religion? Actually the official, official religion of the Roman Empire then what happened the next? The Christians were not fighting for their faith in Jesus Christ any longer. Suddenly they replaced the teaching of the Bible with the Greek philosophy. They started arguing over orthodoxy. And it's interesting is that many strange doctrines crept into the Christian faith. We have here great famine for the word of God. And what a better parallel than the pub parallels with the church in Pergamum that stands for the fourth and the fifth century. And now we are coming to the fourth seal that really describes the complete spiritual death. And the biblical students actually noticed how the fourth seal can aptly apply to the period that we know as the dark middle ages. When really Christianity was killed, when the teaching of the Bible was replaced by tradition, that people tried to find salvation in works, in relics, but the teaching of the Bible and the gospel completely disappeared from the, from the mind of people. And we saw already how actually this period, the dark middle ages could have a strong parallels with the church in Thyatira and the woman Jezebel. The threat to the church came not from outside, actually it came from, from, from inside. So the fourth seal can aptly be applied to the dark, dark middle, middle ages. Okay, but keep in mind, we have two different applications. The symbolic applications, what regularly happens. And please, I would like to stop here for a moment. When we try to apply those seals historically, okay, when, uh, to, those, to those different periods, 
we have to keep in mind not to impose our interpretation on that. Because if you go and take the first seal and limit just to the first century, then what happens? Yeah. Keep in mind, we read in the first seal that the rider on the horse, he came out conquering and to conquer. When will the conquering finally be concluded with the second coming of Christ? We know that before Jesus comes, the second coming of Christ, there will be once again a powerful preaching of the gospel. So the preaching of the gospel did not stop with the first century. The same can be said about the second seal, persecution. Did persecution last only during the second and the third centuries? No, it happened already at the time of Apostle Paul because he was killed. John the Revelator, he uh, went through severe persecution on Patmos. Do you remember that? And that persecution did not stop with the, with the, with the third centuries. So, so do you see it here? You, you have to see the first level of application. Is The same can be about the famine of the word of God. He can argue. Was more famine for the word of God during the fourth or the fifth century than today what we witness. <laughs> so keep in mind, it's very easy to go to one or to another extreme. Do the seven seals have the historic application? Of course, we saw it. Only blind person cannot see those strong parallels. But we cannot impose it. We have first to start with that universal application to tell us actually what always happens when the gospel is being preached. Mm -hmm. That gospel started being preached on the day of Pentecost. Okay. Now, what is the meaning of all of this? We will stop at this moment and begin understanding of the Old Testament background that help us really to understand what the seals are all about. And evidently when it is the most interesting, we will stop and we will meet again in our next presentation. So I would like to encourage you, please come back to our program is, is because we will discover some beautiful, beautiful truth of the Bible. Okay, we mentioned already that the fourth seal somehow encompasses or incorporates the activities of the three previous horsemen. Are you still with me? How do you know that? Please, let's go back one more time to the text. It's verse 8. Verse 8, chapter 6, verse 8 says, And I looked, and behold, the Hessian horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over one-fourth of the earth. And nothing unusual if we stop here at this moment. But look for the following sentence. To kill with the sword. Where did we have the sword? Actually, is in the second, second seal. With the famine. Where did we have a famine? <laughs> in the third one. And with pestilence. Where did we have the pestilence? Here in the fourth one. And a new element is added by the wild beast of the earth. And it's very interesting that so many times people want to ask about seals. They said, what is this all about? And I just want to assure you that the Christians of the time of John, who had the Bible, and that Bible was the Old Testament. At the time, it was the only Bible that they have. Okay, the New Testament was not formed yet. When they read this, they said, Amen, because they knew exactly what it meant. And if you open the Old Testament and we saw that the Old Testament interprets itself, you cannot be far away from the truth. So the time that is just left for us, I'd like to make introduction and to request you, please, can you turn with me to Leviticus chapter 26, verses 21 to 26. Leviticus 26, 21 to 26. What do we have? You remember I told you that we will come back to Leviticus chapter 26? We read the background for the third seal here from this text. What do we have in Leviticus chapter 26? If you see there at the beginning of the chapter, Moses wants to give to the people of Israel a warning telling them, if you obey the Lord your God, if you are faithful to him, if you do not serve other idols, 
God will bless you always. You will be blessed in the house. You will be blessed in the field. He will give you long life. He will give you security and safety from your enemies, etc., etc., etc. But then comes the following section. However, if you disobey the Lord your God, then something will happen. So I, ho I hope that we have enough time. Maybe I will even have to interrupt the reading of this text. So please, let us try to do it. This is what Moses said to them. Chapter 26, Leviticus, from verse 21. If you act with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey me, I will increase the plague on you seven times according to your sins. I will let loose among you the beast of the field, which be, will bereave you of your children and destroy your cattle. What do we have here? The wild beast. Did you see that? And reduce your number so that your roads lie deserted. And if by these things you are not turned to me, but act with hostility against me, what will happen next? I will turn against you and I will strike you seven times for your sin. I will also bring upon you what? A sword upon you, which will execute the vengeance of the covenant. And when you gather together into your cities, I will send what? Pestilence among you, so that you shall be delivered into the enemy's hands. When I break your staff of bread, ten women will bake your bread. Do you see that? In one oven, and they will bring back your bread by weight, so that you will eat and not to be satisfied. Did you notice something? So when John wrote about a sword, about famine, about pestilence and the wild beast, the first century readers did not have any difficulty to understand it. By the way, I have new surprises for you when we come back. And I would like to invite you to study the word of God for yourself. You can see that the Bible is its own interpreter. So I'd like to invite you and to join me next time because we would like really to see the deep significance of the seven seals.